Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. I don't think with this crowd I have to introduce myself, but I, <laughs> I'm Kayla Greenberg, um, director of the Center for Latin American Studies and also at the, a professor at the history department. This is, uh, for those of you who are here for the first time, we are, um, since last year, the past two years, we have created the class speaker series, which is a opportunity for us to discuss themes related to Latin America, but also as a way to sort of integrate the discussion and to create the intellectual environment um, that we want to around uh, the center. So um, this is also an opportunity for us to welcome the new faculty. And that's why to start the class speaker series of this fall, we invited um, Dr. Professor Eladio Bobadilla, who is the new Latinx history professor at the Department of History. So we are very, very happy, Eladio, to start the series with you. Eladio is an assistant professor of history here at the University of Pittsburgh. He is also the 2023 Derrick and Virginia Sherman Scholar at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington and the recipient of also the 2324 Mellon Emerging Faculty Leaders Fellowship. He is coming here from the University of Kentucky after getting a PhD at Duke. So we are very, also very honored to welcome you at the history department. So I'm also honored to be playing both uh, roles here. So thanks, Eladio. I just wanted to say that this is normally, I mean, we are here in a bigger room. This is normally a very informal discussion. So Eladi will talk and we can eat and then I will discuss it a little bit. So thank you. Oh, um, okay. Well, We good? Yeah, go ahead. It's okay. just not sharing, but I'll do troubleshoot. Okay, perfect. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Kayla, for, for the, the warm introduction and for putting this together. Uh, Manuel, I think you're on Zoom. Thank you as well. Um, and thank you all for making time out of your busy midday, you know, Thursday to, to be here. Um, I'm going to try, since this is a small gathering, smallish, to try to, as Kayla said, not make it too formal. So I'll try to avoid reading or, or uh, sort of talking at you too much. Please stop me at any point if you have questions. I'll gladly take them after, but if it makes sense to, to stop at any point and discuss things, I'm happy to do that as well. And so what you're going to be hearing about is the broad overview of the book, my first book, I'm on. title, who knows? Uh, there's four different titles floating around. I have no idea. Uh, I think the latest one is uh, uh, No More Backdoors, uh, History of the Immigrant Rights Movement. We'll see if it sticks. And the question that I that I look at has to do with the relationship between and among Mexican-Americans and Mexican immigrants. Although, as you'll see, by the time we get to the 1980s and certainly the 90s, this is a story that's much bigger than just Mexican-Americans and ethnic Mexicans. It's about uh, Latin America broadly and uh, Latinx people quite broadly. So I start usually by uh, pointing to this document, pretty famous document if you study the history of Mexican Americans. Uh, it's called What Price Wetbacks? Wetbacks, of course, being a derogatory slur uh, referring to undocumented Mexican people. And in 1953 and 54, this document circulated really widely throughout the Southwest. Tens of thousands of copies were floating around all over the Southwest. I don't know if you can really see the, the fine print. I can't even see it from here, partly because I have terrible eyesight, but uh, partly because of the document is a little fuzzy. But you can see some of these bigger headlines and, and you get the message, right? You get what they're trying to, to show, to, to argue, which is that immigrants are a threat, that they're a danger, that, that there's an invasion underway. Not unlike the kinds of things we hear today. 
What is some somewhat surprising uh, to folks who are not familiar with the story is that this wasn't produced by some right wing reactionary conservative, whatever you want to put a label to a uh, right wing nativist racist organization. This was the work of a respected Mexican-American uh, or organization, the American J Forum. And it was backed uh, by the Texas Federation of Labor. So today, when my students, when folks who are not familiar with the story see this, they're they're, they're shocked, right, that this came from a Mexican American group. But at the time, it wouldn't have been surprising at all. In fact, uh, Mexican American organizations like the GA Forum, like the League of United Latin American Citizens (LULAC), and many others, um, not not only were they opposed to undocumented immigration, they actively lobbied for the deportation of Mexican immigrants and fervently supported Operation Wetback, which in 1954 deported over 1 million Mexican citizens from the United States. Two decades later, something interesting happens. The GA Forum, once again, is at the forefront of the immigration debate. But its leadership now is not calling for mass deportations, but for full amnesty. And they argue that Mexican Americans and Mexican immigrants are one people without borders. And the JF Forum was not the only organization. Just about every organization that purported to support Mexican Americans and advance their rights, like LULAC, which I mentioned earlier, the National Council of La Raza, which is now called Unidos US, uh, the Mexican American Political Association, and the United Farm Workers Union, which I'll talk about in just a, a little bit. All of these organizations previously had been. Um, actively lobbying for the deportation of Mexican undocumented people. Now they are very much on their side, not just on their side, but again, sort of saying we're the same people and their rights being violated is our rights being violated. Um, their human rights are our human rights and so on. So this shift happens very quickly. Um, and it's a fairly complete shift, not totally, as I'll talk about in a minute, but by this point, if you're looking at these organizations, it, it seems like it's a complete shift. So the question that I ask is simply, why? Why did this happen so quickly? And why did it happen when it did? It happened around the 1970s. This is when you really see the shift, uh, which is an interesting time because as an economist, immigration economist, Vernon Briggs pointed out in 1975, um, the significance of, as he called it, illegal immigration was most pressing for Mexican-Americans. And indeed, the sheer scale uh, of migration might have been viewed as a threat. You can see the numbers here. Of course, uh, any time you look at numbers of undocumented people, they are uh, tentative. You should take them with a grain of salt. But the best estimates we have gives us a, uh, a sense of the scale. Right. So by 1970-ish, you have half a million undocumented people in the country. By 1975, that has essentially doubled. And then by 1980, it has, once again, tripled. So the scale of migration is huge. And this migration, certainly, as you might have expect, expected, drew much scrutiny from government officials, from labor unions, uh, and from ordinary American citizens. Yet the Mexican-American position now diverged from previous patterns. So how did this happen? Well, I argue that a number of separate but ultimately intertwined and mutually reinforcing developments during the 1960s. Do you have a question? That was certainly part of it. Yeah. Um, you see it more in, in the 80s. But that, that you start to see the beginnings of, of some of this in the 1970s for sure. Yeah. Uh, and so I heard that a number of things are happening at the same time and they're sort of reinforcing each other. And as this happens, Mexican Americans are starting to see immigration policy and debates about immigration as central to their own struggles. Uh, so, one crucial part of this context, and really where the story begins, in a lot of ways is the mid 1960s with the termination of the Bracero program. So Braceros, uh, some of you may know between 1942 and 1964, 
uh, were the 5 million men who were brought on temporary contracts to the United States to address the wartime labor shortage. Um, we have to, I don't know if I have the numbers here. I don't think I do, but um, you, you would have expected to see about half a million each year during the program's peak, uh, which was 1957 to about 1959, toward the end of the 50s. And at the end of the Second World War, Mexican Americans and labor organizations had called for an end to this program, seeing it, I think correctly, as a major obstacle to labor organizing and to economic justice. And in 1964, they finally succeeded in terminating. But although the program ended, immigrants didn't stop coming. Now they simply came without backing. At the same time that this is happening, Congress passed and uh, Lyndon Johnson signed into law the Immigration Nationality Act of 1965, which uh, we often refer to as Hart Seller after its principal sponsors. And Hart Seller was intended as a liberal, anti discriminatory immigration policy, uh, kind of counterpart to the Civil Rights Act. And it did eliminate the national origins quotas that had been instituted earlier in the 20th century, which favored Northern and Western European at the expense of Southern and Eastern European. Uh, and Asian migration, essentially tried to keep out so-called third world peoples, right? But as May and I have shown, Tart Seller actually created the problem of what came to be known as illegal immigration by for the first time placing limits on immigration from the Western Hemisphere in the interest of fairness. Even so, this cap, which was again sort of seen as, a, uh, as, as, as something put in place in the interest of, of fairness, uh, made it so that not only would this problem continue, but that it would become bigger than ever. After all, countries in Latin America, particularly Mexico, uh, needed many more visas than say, Ireland and Germany or Germany or any Western European country. So the rise of this mass scale, again, so-called illegal immigration also meant increased contacts and connections between Mexican Americans and Mexican immigrants who became neighbors, co-workers, uh, people they worshiped with. And this led to Mexican Americans often experiencing the indignities of immigration control and policing. As immigrants were targets of raids, arrests, harassment, so were Mexican Americans, who were often caught in the middle and often assumed to be illegal themselves. As journalist Ruben Salazar wrote in those years, Chicanos had begun to recognize that, quote, they look alike to the Border Patrol. Dick Rivas, another journalist covering Chicano issues in the 1960s and 70s, similarly explained that during this period, uh, as he put it, any lawman could apprehend the undocumented or anyone suspected of being unauthorized based solely on their skin color and the language they spoke, even what they wore. And he said some officials even made it a sport. And this is all happening, of course, in the fields and the barrios, but there is a broader context as well. So briefly, uh, I, I like to mention uh, what is the most obvious in some sense um, context, which is the African-American civil rights movement and the victories that were also changing the contours of ethnic history and the political calculus more broadly for people like Mexican-Americans. This is especially true after the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which, uh, as Nancy McLean has demonstrated, encouraged Mexican-Americans to abandon the whiteness strategy. And there's been debate about whether this actually existed or to the extent to which Mexican Americans actually relied on this claim uh, to whiteness. But to the extent that it existed, um, they're abandoning that and embracing their Mexicans. And they do it partly as a cultural response, but also partly as a legal response, as a way to make claims on the state now that the Civil Rights uh, Act has been passed. Another really critical part of the story is what's happening in the fields, particularly in Central California. Um, the farm labor movement led by Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers Union. So Chavez saw that the end of the Bracero program had finally provided an opening uh, for effective organizing in the fields. But he also saw what he, like most others in the country, called illegal immigration as a threat to unionization. Because growers could and did count on those uh, slurred as wetbacks to undermine the standards won by organized labor. This is a very real problem. Right? Um, 
again, there's been a lot of debate about how we should see this history, um, but it's difficult to deny that that this was a real problem for the U.S. Right? The presence of large numbers of undocumented people made it very, very difficult to organize. And since the California state government was essentially in league with the growers and employers, union leadership decided to tackle the problem themselves. It was a brutal and calculated campaign against undocumented workers. Yes. Uh, yeah. So for about two years, the union created its own border patrol. Um, they patrolled the Yuma, Arizona in groups of about 30 to sometimes as many as 300. Um, and they worked to find, catch, and deport or turn over to immigration authorities unsanctioned immigrants who, in their view, if they were allowed to enter the country, would become scabs. Beatings were common and rumors of more serious crimes spread. The Chicano movement, which ironically had often credited its genesis to UFW and Cesar Chavez's movements, responded with shock and uh, disgust. In fact, the episode revealed serious fault lines in the Mexican-American community and forced people to have really uncomfortable conversations about immigration, about race, about citizenship. And for those who had come to find pride and hope and purpose in the ideology of Chicanismo and in the farm labor movement, watching Chavez and his border guards beat poor immigrants seemed entirely incompatible with the ideas, uh, ideas and ideals of this nascent movement. Again, by this point, we're talking about neighbors and coworkers, sometimes even family members. This wasn't some abstract invasion anymore. In the 1950s, often Mexican-Americans could, could think of this as, as something that was affecting them, and that was fairly abstract. Um, now it was people they knew, right? And so most Chicanos quickly and very forcefully denounced the white line, which is what Chica, uh, Chavez called this, this border uh, activity, uh, this initiative. And the pressure became so great that by 1975, the union and Chavez specifically reversed uh, their position, saying that mistakes had been made. I'm talking, you know, it's a it's direct quote, it's very passive. Um, Chavez never really takes accountability for this um, and often just sort of vaguely refers to this, this, this episode um, to something that he felt had to be done. And when things got ugly, um, it's some passive things were done, bad things happened, right? But he does reverse his position by 1975. Um, and this is in no small part because of the pressure that he and the union received from radical Chicanos, who in fact were essential and had been essential in creating and building a pro-immigrant rights movement in the midst of all this turmoil. Uh, by the way, this is just a couple of excerpts from oral histories, uh, folks that I talked to uh, at the time and what they heard, what they thought of the labor, uh, the, the farm labor movement and how undocumented people were, were treated. Um, one man, you know, said our own people are coming after us. And then a second person put it in slightly more colorful terms. Uh, but this was very much known to immigrants that the UFW was not, was that friendly to undocumented people. So no one was more essential, as I was saying a minute ago, in creating and building this pro-immigrant consciousness than Bert Corona. He's a Mexican-American socialist and labor organizer who encouraged his fellow Chicanos to, to get angry and, and to to fight back, but not at the undocumented, not their co-ethnics, uh, at those he called the real enemy, the bosses, the employers, the capitalist state. <laughs> Treating immigrants, this is Bert Corona, by the way. Um, yeah, this is Bert Corona. Uh, Treating immigrants as the problem, he thought, was in, in fact dividing the working class further. So he urged Chicanos to defend their brethren, uh, to, to see themselves as some earlier groups had said uh, as one group as one people without borders and he was the first not to not to claim this idea but to popularize it and it immediately gained a wider hearing and this was fairly new um Bert Corona was um, 
was active in Southern California for the most part. And there is another figure that I think I'll get to in a second. Herman Baca um, kind of takes over this movement. But Herman Baca um, likes to tell the story of when he met Kurt Corona. And Corona and Baca came together and, and were talking about the idea of organizing Chicanos and fighting for their rights. And uh, Bert Corona, a young man at the time, asked, I'm sorry, um, Baca asked Corona at the time, how do we do it? What's what's the first step? How do we how do we start this fight? Bert Corona says, we've got to get ahead of this immigration issue. And uh, Baca says, what's that got to do with this? And he says, you know, at the time, this is how everybody saw it. Immigration was some other issue. Right? Chicanos, Mexican-Americans were fighting for their own battles, fighting for their own advancement. Immigration didn't seem like it was part of that fight. Bert Corona changed all of this by articulating how, in fact, it was. And by popularizing this idea. Um, so in the context of what Mary, Mary Dudzik has called the Cold War Civil Rights, um, Bert Corona really gets people talking about how we might begin to think of this as a global issue, as an, as an issue of capital and labor, and not something localized, not something that was happening in, in the 1970s in the Southwest. And this brought in all sorts of new activists, uh, people like Miguel Pendas and Herman Baca, who I mentioned a minute ago, who then worked to spread these ideas and to fight for immigrant workers um, under the assumption that by, by working toward the most oppressed, uh, they would be helping themselves too that the world, they thought, could be changed radically and for the better. And they did a number of things uh, on the ground. They tried to, to organize people, talk about some of the ways in a minute. One of the things they did um, that hasn't been talked about a lot is they organized by appealing to transnational bodies like the United Nations. In 1974, activists presented the Charter of Rights for Immigrant Workers, or the Immigrants' Bill of Rights, as it has become uh, you know which Corona drafted with the help of uh, a young Catholic priest named Mark Day, who has never gotten the dues. I mean, most people don't even know who he is, but he was central to this movement. Uh, he's no longer a priest, but he's still around. He's, uh, he's still active in, in social justice struggles. And he himself at the time was part of this upsurge of progressive Catholic thinking, uh, encouraged by the Second Vatican Council and related uh, developments. And they modeled this document that I uh, showed a minute ago. Actually, it's there already. They modeled this document after key UN uh, charters, like the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the 66 Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, uh, the 1974 Declaration on the Establishment of a New International Economic Order, and so on. The charter that Corona and Day produced declared that immigrants had a number of human rights that were often completely ignored, the right to be free from deportations, the right to unite with their families, the right to normalize their status, the right to participate in all areas of employment, including labor unions, and uh, to have job security, equal pay. On this latter point, Chicanos were also looking abroad for inspiration on how to deal with immigration. Um, this was not a problem unique to the United States. European, as some of you who study Europe would know quite well, European Citizens and unions were also dealing with this with this question at the same time. So they often had communication and, and shared ideas about how to organize um, the undocumented people. Uh, and as Julie Watts has shown, these unions in Europe are often ahead of this, a um, little bit ahead of the U.S. unions on the issue. Not all of them, uh, but some of them had come to see immigrants there as, quote, an integral part of the working class. This is from one such document where European unions were articulating this point. So as Mexican-Americans come to uh, empathize with, to feel a genuine affinity for their undocumented co-ethnics, several US labor unions are also starting to, to become more accepted. It's a slow process, but they're starting to shift their ideas on immigration. And by 1980, we have a number of unions who are, I got ahead of myself there, by 1980, we have a number of unions uh, who have shifted their position. Again, the UFW is now one of them. Um, although even, even at this point, I would not call them leaders of this movement. They're sort of begrudgingly accepting that immigrants are coming, that uh, the undocumented are going to continue to come, and that there has to be some way to deal with them that doesn't antagonize the unions uh, with 
the broad uh, Mexican American public. But there are others, and some are actually leading this, this effort. Um, uh, again, the UFW is sort of just going along with it, but there are some like the Farm Labor Organizing Committee, FLOC, uh, and the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, who are very much uh, active in the pro-immigrants right struggle um, and who are explicit in their support for immigrants. So this is kind of a broad and very quick overview of this massive shift. But what I want you to take away from this is simply that this affinity that we that we assume exists and we can talk about whether you know it really exists or whether it has been a linear progression or not. Uh, but whatever affinity exists today between Mexican Americans, Latinx people, and undocumented immigrants didn't just occur. It wasn't always there, and it certainly didn't just pop up. It took a lot of work. And it came as a result of policy changes that often were not thought of as having to do anything with immigration, but, but certainly did to some degree. Um, and some that were more related to immigration, like the end of the Bracero program, the passage of a hard seller. It also, of course, included social development, social movements, uh, the shift happening in the UFW. All of this put together produced this, this massive shift. It comes by... Uh, it comes to fruition by the 1980s. Again, uh, whether that has remained linear, whether that exists today is a matter of, of debate. But by the 1980s, I certainly read this movement as having shifted completely. And one of the, the ways in which it shifts is that it no longer is a civil rights movement. Really, it's a human rights movement. Um, there, Mexican Americans in particular kind of abandon the strategy of calling for civil rights, uh, partly because they have to embrace people who are not citizens and can't use those, those civil rights. So they, they frame it as a human rights struggle. So yeah, this shift was never total. Um, We'll debate how how to, you know how how much this actually happened, how much it shifted, how much it stayed shifted, you know how how much it has backtracked in some ways. Uh, so here are some notable exceptions, right? Um, we saw a lot of this during the election of Donald Trump, um, just before and, and just after. And you still see it in some circles, but there are still you know groups who are supportive of of reactionary nativist immigration tactics. But if we sort of look at this movement in the 1980s, if we look at the broad, broad cross-section of Mexican-Americans, it would have been pretty unthinkable um, to see the language that you saw at the beginning uh, in that document and what price went backs in the 1980s. That just was not, not there, right? That language did exist, of course, but it had become more or less the exclusive domain of the reactionary right uh, of the Klan. Here you have David Duke in 1977 in this clownish car, which to me, it's okay. If it weren't so dangerous, it'd be kind of goofy. Right? But uh, yeah, so David Duke and other Klan members uh, go to the border, bullets. They rent airplanes and fly overhead. They don't actually accomplish anything, but it's it's a big publicity stunt. So this is not, I mean, at, at one point when I started this, when I was a naive grad student, I wanted to write this triumphant story of how Mexican-Americans and Mexican immigrants came together and won. It's not the story I'm telling now, unfortunately. It's it's not a happily ever after story. There was there was a price to pay for this shift. Possibly several prices. But one of the, the ways in which Chicano sort of paid a price is that there was a growing polarization between Mexican Americans and Mexican immigrants and other Latinx people and white people generally, who were also you know increasingly radicalized in their case, obviously to to the right, and in a way that echoed and in some ways prefigured um, the calls that we've heard from from the reactionary right in more recent years. So I think, I hope that my work really illuminates questions about modern US history more broadly too. This is, as I see it, not just about immigration, but about 
something much bigger. There is perhaps no more significant development in the, last, in the last 50 years than the ascendancy of the reactionary rights and its popularity can be attributed in large part to anxieties about immigration and the browning of America. Um, just quickly, this is uh, Spurt Corona on the right, Armin Baca, who kind of took over after, uh, after Corona got older and, and passed. Uh, and then one other notable Chicano activist, Rodolfo Corky Gonzalez. So yeah, this, this growth uh, in the unauthorized population um, and fears of so-called invaders and alleged foreign welfare abusers, or all of these, these notions um, really take off in the 1970s, uh, continue through the 80s, and as I'll, as I'll talk in a minute, really balloon and blow up in the 1990s. The growing presence of undocumented immigrants in the country, and uh, as I argue, the growing ethnic movement that welcomed them, triggered a fierce nativist backlash among a good number of, of white Americans. And they lumped together citizens, US citizens uh, of Mexican ethnicity, with the people they called illegal aliens, permanent residents, right? For a lot of people, this became one single group. Um, so in a sense, what Chicanos had tried to do by saying we're one people without borders is what the right latches onto. It says, you're right, you're all bad. You're all illegal, right? Um, and that sort of has the effect of reducing all brown people to semi-citizens is, is what Elizabeth Cohen, a political scientist that call it. Uh, Gene Beeman calls them citizen outsiders. Both, I think, really good, interesting, and helpful concepts uh, to signal the fragility and conditionality of citizenship uh, among people of uh, Latinx descent. By the 1980s, this nativist anger was driving policy change. This calls for immigration reform led eventually, after a protracted fight, um, to what became known as the Immigration Reform and Control Act, or sometimes you'll hear it referred to by its acronym, IRCA. Chicanos moved from regional into national politics. This was no longer a conversation confined to the Southwest. This was a national story. And they began to fight uh, what they viewed as the racist provisions of the law, while advocating for more favorable aspects of it, namely amnesty for the undocumented. In their response, which tried to be nuanced, but uh, was always difficult for them. They always had to make uh, points that placed them at odds with, with other policy groups. Chicanos found themselves in this, these really odd coalitions, at times fighting alongside business interests to prevent things like employer sanctions. Uh, obviously, employers didn't want sanctions because they didn't want to be sanctioned. Uh, but Chicanos didn't want sanctions because they were worried that it would lead to discrimination, to businesses saying, well, we can't hire brown people we might end up accidentally hiring undocumented people and getting fined. 1986 marks when this law was finally signed after, uh, again, this protracted fight. Um, they called this this bill or a series of bills Lazarus. It kept dying and then being revived over and over. So this Lazarus finally you know, lives uh, in 1986. And, and what it does is it just gives something to everyone. It's, it's just master uh, compromise of a law. It gives amnesty to undocumented immigrants, about 2.7 to 3 million of them. It gives increased border enforcement to nativists, militarizing the US border as never before. And it gave employer penalties to organized labor. So it gives something to everyone, but because this was you know, the result of competing contradictory impulses and a number of overlapping bargains between you know, uh, labor unions, uh, business interests, ethnic groups, nativist actors. No one was satisfied. Give something to everyone, but no one actually likes what they do in the end. So maybe the only exception to this is the undocumented themselves. You know, for again, three million people, their lives changed totally. Suddenly, like overnight, uh, exaggerating only a little bit, but it's actually fairly easy to get uh, legalization after 86, um, after this law is passed. And these millions of people, mostly men, um, but also some women, were able to work the right way, as many of them say, uh, 
and advance in their jobs, to find better jobs, to go to school, to get an education, to buy homes, to become citizens in time, which then allows them to uh, to bring family members uh, or to have access to basic safety nets like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, some of which were life-saving. Um, one of the quotes I showed you earlier, uh, Abel Guzman, I talked to him about five, six years ago, and, and he, you know, he told me if it hadn't been for, for this law, I wouldn't have seen my son graduate college. I wouldn't have spent 10, 15 years um, that I've been given. He was on dialysis by this point and uh, slowly declining, but he, you know, he was able to, to get medical care and to live a little bit longer to see some of his kids graduate college to help them through those former years. So this was, in a, in a real sense, for a lot of people, life and death. Chicano activists, however, you know, didn't seem, for, to them, it didn't seem like the gains were worth the costs. Herman Baca called Urca, quote, the biggest failure since prohibition and the 55 mile speed. Limit. And nativists too felt like Urca had failed. Not only did it fail to stem the flow of immigrants, but it had actually encouraged migration in their eyes. And certainly by the 1990s, there were an estimated 2 million undocumented workers again in the country. Um, most of them in California, with some called the new Ellis Island. And once again, we have this resulting wave of nativism from the perceived failure of IRCA. Um, this led to the drafting of Proposition 187 in 1993 for the 1994 election in California. They called it the SOS Initiative, Save Our States. Um, State Assemblyman Dick Mountjoy introduced introduced it as a re referendum initiative in 1994, and Governor Pete Wilson, then trailing in the polls against challenger Kathleen Brown, quickly endorsed it and made it his central campaign. I mean, his entire campaign was about Prop 187. Some of the key provisions law enforcement would not only be allowed, but required to stop anyone suspected of being an undocumented alien and to question them about their status. Local governments would be barred from enacting any local law that challenged the provisions of 187. This is uh, in the, an attempt to, to stunt the growth of sanctuary cities, among other things. Anyone uh, interest or anyone applying for or receiving public services would have to prove their citizenship status, and this included uh, non-emergency healthcare services and schools. And schools were also required within two years to verify the legal status of every child in their districts and their parents. So this this initiative was incredibly broad and draconian, and it was also incredibly popular. This never works. I'm going to try it. No, it doesn't work. <laughs> Problems with this every time. I don't know what it is. This is an ad from 1994. Um, just briefly describe it. If you ever want to see it, you can go to YouTube and just type Prop 187. Um, they keep coming. This is the They Keep Coming ad. It shows shadowy figures running across the border and this ominous voice saying, they keep coming. And then there's all this thing. And then, you know, uh, people have since introduced saying, now I, I'm going to send the National Guard and put a stop to this and so on. So every ad, it seemed, uh, that he was running, um, every speech, it seems, is about Prop 187. It becomes, um, it becomes a thing that he, he's running on. And it's popular. He was way behind in the polls. He embraces 187. And then he's not behind at all. This was a very popular initiative. And... Uh, in the end, it passes with almost 60% uh, of the electorate voting in favor of it. This breaks it down by uh, race or ethnicity. And as you can see, every non-Hispanic group uh, voted in favor of it. Obviously, whites by a larger margin than anyone else. But uh, Black Californians and Asian Californians also um, by slight margins. Uh, voted in favor of it. Hispanic voters are an interesting case. Um, about a quarter of them vote in favor, the rest against. What you don't really see here is um, earlier polls. So when this is first introduced, 
Some polls had support for this among Hispanics as high as about 67 to 70%. So there's a tremendous amount of work going on behind the scenes to shift those numbers and it's successful. It's just not successful enough among the other groups. Even so, that's, you know, I find that number really interesting, 25%. That's one in four Hispanics supported this. Um, is that a big number or is that a small number? I don't know. Like in a sense, obviously the vast majority rejected it in the end, even though many had considered voting for it. Uh, on the other hand, it's again, one in four after everything that was said and done and all the like, racist ads and, and, and the nativist rhetoric, one in four still voted in favor of it. So again, um, worth considering just how definitive the shift was even at that point or has been more recently. So it passes um, immediately Mexican American groups and other Latino groups, uh, the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund, MELDA, um, the American Civil Liberties Union and others sued and won a temporary injunction just days later in 1998, four years after it was voted, uh, voted in, George Mariana Fauser dealt the final blow to 187, consider, or striking it down as unconstitutional. But even there, it's not the end of, of the movement. Uh, it's not the end of the story. In some ways, Prop 187 was a kind of beginning, a moment that led directly, I argue, to our current moment in ways that historians have just now begun to consider. Prop 187 represented a stark illustration of the relationship between local or state dynamics and national politics, as well as the central paradox in modern immigration history, the enduring place of vulnerable immigrants as essential but unwanted. Unwanted as citizens or as full participants in civic and economic life, but essential as workers and as scapegoats, a position that helps uh, explain the long history of a paradoxical and at times seemingly schizophrenic immigration regime that at once invites immigrants and rejects them. And perhaps this is best summarized by Milton Friedman, the Nobel Prize winning libertarian economist who summarized this paradox back in 1977 when he was asked about immigration. He was asked, is immigration, uh, specifically illegal immigration, undocumented immigrants, is it good? And he responds uh, in this way. He said, Look, for example, the obvious, immediate, practical example of illegal immigration uh, in Me from Mexico. Now, that Mexican immigration, he says, over a border is a good thing. It's a good thing for the illegal immigrants. It's a good thing for the United States. It's a good thing for the citizens of the country. But it's only good as long as it's illegal. In other words, immigrants could always be relied upon to serve as economic assets, to provide cheap labor and indirect subsidies but they could also become liabilities if given political, human, and economic rights. Now such a fuller view of Prop 187's, uh, Prop 187's history, its roots, its consequences, helps us, I think, to understand two more concrete and seemingly contradictory, but ultimately parallel developments. First, it explains how immigrants and their allies, mostly the Latino activists, which now, again, included not just Mexican Americans, but Central American, uh, immigrants and their families, sought to turn a moment of defeat into a robust political movement as they drew on a much longer history of pro-immigrants rights activism dating to the 1960s and 70s, when this nascent movement began to develop in tandem with the Chicano movement. As Herman Baca put it, nativist had, quote, made a grave political error because they have attacked our most prized possession, our children, he cautioned, for us, there are no more, more back doors. And secondly, it illustrates how the success of pro-immigrant organizing in the states motivated nativists to reimagine California or reimagine it as the first salvo in a longer war to be fought and won at the national level. A war that would in time be embodied by the campaign and election of Donald Trump. This story is in a lot of ways still being uh, written. The work of individuals, families, communities, activists, organizations, and policymakers will continue to define it and how we tell it. So my hope is that the lessons in this, in this book that I'm working on, uh, both historical and political, help offer us new and different ways of imagining the world uh, and that 
that we emerge from these relationships and conversations uh, in a way that allows us, allows some future historian to write the story of triumph that I had hoped to write. Thank you. I'll take any questions now. Uh, well, thank you, Eladio. And I, I heard a bit of a version of this at, at your talk. Mm -hmm. So, um, and um, so the question I'm going to ask has I both to do with the fact that I know a little bit more about the sure. account than most people do. But um, it makes total. I mean, your your question is great. You know about the chip, and you um, emphasize different factors, including daily interactions between Mexican Americans and Mexican immigrants. Um, and then you end with mainly with Proposition 180. So, which I remind you again, is your, is your book mainly focused on California? No, no, it's not. It's, well, the Southwest, okay. broadly. Um, I think it's becoming more and more California centric as we go. Because <laughs> uh, I, I was wondering if you wanted to go the other way. Yeah. Um, and because what you talk about with Prop, Prop 187 reminds me a lot about. Um, the English only laws and their effects in particularly more like in Florida, Miami. Uh, I'm assuming you're familiar with the book Sitting on the Edge. Mm. And so I was wondering um, what role, but that's a different kind of form of anti-Latino violence, right? Um, yeah. And and involves, but involves very different kinds of uh, political groups, particularly part of the establishment. Mm -hmm. One of the key promoters of the English only law in Miami was, was the Miami Herald. Mm. Uh, and so I was wondering, I guess, one, what role do English only laws play in your story? Um, it might be more regional phenomenon. I'm not yeah. sure. I know they were very powerful in the Midwest, too, but I'm not sure about the West. Yeah. Um, and then also, if that be another way for you to talk a bit more about uh, pan-Latino identity formation. Yeah. Um, because that was also something that the Chicano movement struggled with. Right. I'm more familiar with their interactions with Central American immigrants in California. Um, but that's that's not even happened with the English only law. Yeah. Even very conservative um, by then, the Cuban community, politically speaking, at least, have been taken have been sort of taken over by more conservative groups. But it's the English only laws that lead to the formation of the Cuban American National Foundation, not not prior. So I'm yeah. wondering. I guess two things. One, the role of English only laws in your story, um, and what maybe doesn't play a role in California. And second, also the question of kind of on Latino identity. Oh, thank you, Michelle. And th they absolutely play a role. Um, when we encounter the early movement, they're they're talking about this, and, and this is a movement that's also gaining traction in California. Um, it's easy to forget that California is you know, the epicenter of the conservative, the modern conservative movement, right? We think of it as this blue state and part of why it's so blue is because of what happens in 94. But before that, you know, California, Orange County in particular, but other parts of California too are hotbeds of conservative thought and, and conservative movement. And yet uh, the, a lot of what's happening in the 1970s has to do with this question about English um, uh, in California and, and other places. Um, so that's part of the story for sure. And this, it's no coincidence that 1994, and Prop 27 uh, kind of center in California. This is there's a long history there of anti-immigrant um, nativism there. As far as the the kind of broader pan Latin uh, Latino movement, um, yeah, it's it's something that I I have yet to to do as well as I hope to do it. Um, as a dissertation, this is strictly about Mexican American uh, identity and Mexican American struggles. As I've revised this and 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 tried to to make it a, a real book. Um, yeah, it's impossible to deny the way in which uh, by the 1970s, late 70s, certainly the 80s and 90s, it's not just Mexican immigrants and Mexican American or Mexican Americans, but also Central American descended people, Central American immigrants, right? They are bringing their own concerns, uh, one of which is the way that they're being treated in Mexico, right? Who by the 90s and certainly more recently uh, is treating Central American immigrants, Caribbean immigrants as well, or refugees, in exactly the same way that its citizens were treated in the U.S. and at the U.S. border for decades. And the cruel irony there is that, you know, they learn these immigration control mechanisms and these, these brutal ways of handling migration 
from their experience as ascending nation. They learn it really well and they apply it very, very well, right? Um, and maybe I'm not addressing your, your question here, but uh, what comes to mind when I think about Pan Latinx uh, identity is is the way that Chicanos have responded to this question, which is with a lot of distrust and, and anger sometimes. So I just spoke to Bert Kron, Bert Kron, to Herman Baca um, about two weeks ago, and we've had four or five oral histories and phone conversations about this. Um, and he gets unreasonably angry when he hears someone say Latinx, Latinx. He calls it an insult to Chicanos and to the, the memory of those who, who, who fought for decades. He sees it as something fundamentally different. He refuses to see it as an evolution, right? which I find interesting and uh, odd sometimes and a little disturbing in other ways. But but yeah, and, and he, they also make these claims, right, that they were doing it right in the 60s and 70s, and everyone else now is doing it wrong. No one cares anymore. These young people don't know what they're doing. They have zero capacity for organizing. Um, this is why we're losing, right? Um, failing to you know, consider that a lot of these organizations blew themselves up in the 1960s and 70s because of the infighting. So... It's messy, right? And uh, I'm trying to figure out how, how to tell the story in a way that, that does justice to all the different groups who are involved um, and who uh, who force these evolutions in these uncomfortable conversations. Okay. And back here, and then Pernell? Maybe. California, and the younger kids in history because it seems there's um I we do pay to go visits yeah. and one of the schools when we try to teach them about Latino Latinx. Yeah. Latinx Hispanic. They all question why we have so many names. Yeah. So we try to not experts but explain. And one of them as I say there's an experts that say uh we didn't go to the border, the border came to yeah. us. Right. So how Ooh. do you or oh, how do they teach this in school? Do they, do they have this in school or is just something that is talking about it now? Is there an approach to teach the kids or the younger generations this? Because they're the people who will be voting in the future. I genuinely don't know. That's a great question. Uh, and that's something that I should think about. That's an article. I think. That's my next article. I don't know. Um, I don't know. Um, I get I, I get the sense that it's it's talked about more often than than in other places because it is California history. Um, I can tell you that when I was in school, I never heard about it. I learned about Prop 187 when I was in college. Um, that's a great question. I suspect that it's talked about that it's addressed maybe in California history courses, not so much in U.S. history. Well, the argument that I'm trying to make here is that it's it's U.S. history, right? And it's something that happens in California because that's where activists see the most promise, and it works. Uh, but then they under they also understand that it's going to fail constitutionally, but it doesn't matter because that they've already fired the first shot, and they get what they want over the next twenty. They play the slow game and they win with Donald Trump. Like this is exactly what happens. I I argue that there's a direct line between Prop 187 and Donald Trump. Um, I can tell you that. There are places where I know it's not talked about almost at all. I have been working on this question of how this was perceived in other parts of the country. Um, so in Texas, for example, during this debate, uh, one of the really weird, interesting things that happens is that people in Texas, Latinos in Texas, are horrified at what's happening in California. And they, they say or think, that's loony. Like, that could never happen in Texas, right? This kind of fear is anti-immigrant sentiment that's not going to happen in texas we're too we have too many ties to to our people south of the border we're too close to mexico in a way that california doesn't see itself as being close even though of course they border um what's happened of course is that california has become blue and quite pro-immigrant not entirely of course but it's one of the safest places where you can be an immigrant and texas has become texas right so People didn't expect it to play out this way at the time. Um, you know, there were academics and scholars at the time who saw it as a purely California, a loony California thing that couldn't happen anywhere else. 
but thank you. That's a great question. And I should, I should know the answer to that. I don't. Brunilla, I think. Yeah, that's not a good question. <laughs> it's kind of just uh, exposed me as a, a not a role with that specialist to begin with. But when you were telling the story, I kept thinking, what's what's unique in ethics about this story? And I'm, you know, I, I can try to think of that. But then if you think about this as like the story of many um, ethnic minorities that are migrating both into the United States or into Europe, and and I'm thinking, so when you think about this, do you? I don't know if you think about this. Um, is it a disciplinary thing that it becomes a Latinx story? Or is this a, a much bigger story that is just becoming Latinx because you are focusing on this? But mm -hmm. because you, you sort of invite us to think about a, a broader picture because you have these graphs that show that Asian Americans are voting in, in this yeah. way, um, African Americans are voting in this way, but you're also mentioning a similar process for the presentation for Europe. Right? So I'm just curious about. What Latinx, what Latin American story in this, and, and what's actually just the perspective that would that might just shift if you took like a global perspective? Yeah. yeah. Can I jump in? Please. Because I have a very similar question, which is it seems, of course, this is a US history. And I think your point about being a US history is very good. In the other hand, I was thinking about um, immigrants in Brazil at that mm. time, or could be in Europe. And how much this is a story of 20th century immigration and the shifts and the generation shifts between yeah. the one who become, let's say, Mexican American or whatever, and the newcomers. Yeah. Because it's true that it's a story, it's you know, when you define it as a history of capitalism and cheap labor, it is. At the same time, there is an ethos of the immigrants and immigration sometimes just divided between siding with the main establishment and become conservative and some other groups that are just that they would be opponents of the system yeah. even though they're so it's just it's just it's the same question as Bernina. It's just I've been thinking about that and how how this is also a problem of yeah. dislocation and yeah. No, I think it's a global story. I don't think it's exceptionally or uniquely Latinx or even U.S. And part of this is a symptom of U.S. historians. Um, I don't know what to call it. Um, we've for decades now worked to shed notions of American exceptionalism. But at the same time, we've embraced the kind of negative exception exceptionalism. We're you know, exceptional in our immigration policies. We're exceptionally restrictive. We're exceptionally racist. Well, those of you who study other parts can, you know, point to how that's not that's not true. Um, now, that's not to say we aren't often extremely racist, restrictive, but this is happening globally. Yeah, this is not just the U.S. Uh, I've been writing a lot lately about again Mexico and how it has embraced the same posture. Um, you know, as as we had the alt right ch uh, chanting "America first in in our streets all over the country. Uh, there were people in Mexico organizing against migrants and refugees chanting Mexico first. So <laughs> some of them might have, you know how that goes, but, but you know, this is happening globally. Um, and I'm not a specialist in Europe, but I, I know enough to know that this, this is the same story, right? And Chicanos are pointing that out in the seventies or so. This is, as this is happening here, this is happening in Europe. Um, you know, they're dealing with questions about irregular, irregular migration from, from Africa, from Asia. Um, this is happening in South America. This is happening all over the globe. Um, and the the quicker we think of this as a global story about capital and labor, the more sense we can make of it and the better our responses. But it might also help you sort of make an argument for for, for Pan Latinidad, right? To go back yeah. to this first question. Right, because right, I was sitting here thinking about um similar issues, right, with the the waves of Cuban migration, right, and in Florida and and the East Coast, right, where you have these moments in time where depending on what wave you arrive in the US and depending on the status with which you arrive, your relationship to newer generations of Cubans is completely different. And no one will will acknowledge it or talk about it openly. But the the racism and the vergüenza ajena, the shame by association yeah. is absolutely there, right? And so I, I wonder what it says when we talk about this sort of shared 
experience that depending on one's uh, migratory experience, depending on the status when they are received or not in this country, depending on their right um, economic status and yeah. social status at a particular moment in time, all of these things sort of affect the yeah. opportunities or not. Right, to either lend a hand or not to the next generation. Yeah, Herman Baca talks about this. Uh, this I like, this is fascinating. <laughs> he was asked in the 1970s, um, that he was interviewed all the time uh, by folks. He was kind of the face of the immigrant rights movement. He was once asked, what do you make of 65, 70% of, of, at the time, let's say Hispanic, Hispanic people supporting res well, more restriction of immigration? And he says he would respond by saying, that's it, 70%? I can show you a group that's like 95% against it. It's those guys that just came in from the border that just crossed the border two hours ago, right? There's, a, there's a, oh my God, I'm, I'm, uh, I wish I could pull up, there's a great comedy bit by, I think it's Andrew Schultz, talks about Cuban attitudes toward immigrants and how at yeah, the moment they you know they step foot on, on dry land, like, okay, no more, that's it, we're good. No more immigration. There's too many people here already, right? And it's, it's, this, is, this is happening with all these communities, right? And, um, and now when I do oral histories, I you know, started this in 2013 when I was in grad school, I would talk to immigrants about their experiences and, and the struggles that they faced. And then sometimes I've gone back to the same people. I love to see how their views change. They're only the same person over a number of years. Now they're talking about, you know, the, the Central American migration phenomenon and how irresponsible it is that they're coming and sending their kids and how awful that is and how they're, they're ruining communities. And it's just, it's heartbreaking and a little gut-wrenching, right? The same people that five, six years ago were telling us how difficult their lives were, how badly they were treated, now are using that same rhetoric uh, about Central American and Caribbean migrants. It's hard to make sense. I mean, it there are, there are ways to explain it, uh, but they're all really heartbreaking. And go ahead, Rachel. Yeah. Yeah. Right, that's the... Yeah. It's not the same with age, like if you're a rat, you know, once you make the money, you're not going to start again. <laughs> but uh, I have a more of a comment. Um, yesterday, I was listening to the radio. There's a there's a news show on the radio about Spanglish in advertising. And there's a ratio now that's currently setting for 20 to 80%. So 80% being English, 20% being Spanish. And they were testing and projecting this Spanish um, percentage to increase as, as time goes on. And they played a, um, like an ad, it was something like, oh, you know, come over here. No, some of those equalities. And then, you know, there's, there's, there's entire phrases, sentences in, in Spanish with a normal conversation just following in, 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 in Spanish, which is you know, what Spanish should be. And the projection was also that new idioms, new languages would also receive the same treatment as, of course, the buying power and as the 20% of the Latino or, or Latino descent population gets really into, mm. you know, into, into the play here, into the book. So I think it's really interesting because in one way we come from a English only law and then now the same establishment and then the same regime or whatever you want to call it, the same capitalism or, you know, who really, um, pays or, or salaries, right? Yep. Um, is saying that, okay, so we're doing 80, 20, but that's going to increase yep. until what percentage are we going to see? Because that's, that's an ad, not only it, of course, is for a targeted community, but then for a targeted community, they should be, you know, they could easily do an entire ad in Spanish. Yeah. So rather than mixing English, so I just thought it was very interesting. That is really fascinating. I kind of go slightly in a different direction, going back yes. to what Danilo was asking you about what is a Latino about this history. And, and yeah, I mean, it makes total sense to focus on capital and to make this a global story. I, I totally get that. But I guess as someone who not only works in Central America, but also in you know, US intervention, I, I do want to, I wonder if you want to also um, make a stronger case for what's a Latino about this in the sense that. In many ways, yes, all these global factors play a role. 
in driving the movement of people to the U.S. and the South. But there's also the long history of U.S. intervention, yeah. which is also the Europeans have that too, like the French with colonialism. Mm -hmm. But it's not the same thing, right? The nature of U.S. intervention in Latin America. And I'm wondering if that, that's something that you can do. I mean, the most simplistic way of doing it is that many of them, some of the Mexican American families in the Southwest were there before it, right. the U.S. even existed, mm -hmm. right? Which, which you don't have in the United um, so I can see how you can gain a lot by making this a global story, but I'm wondering if you, if you just pitch it at the global level, if you're going to lose something yeah. that, you know, is there a way to combine the two? Like, right. What I'm trying to get at. Yeah, good. I, and that's my question too, right? How to, what the balance is, uh, when and where, uh, to bring in the global versus the, the kind of unique, uh, conditions created by U.S. intervention. I mean, you can't understand the, the, the nature of Cuban migration to the U.S. without the history right. of U.S. intervention. Yeah. I would say the same thing for Central America, yeah. despite all you know the causes of poverty, environment, and blah, blah, blah. I mean, the fact that you have it, that, we, that it's so strong from Central America, in my opinion, has a lot to do with the nature of U.S. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. But yeah, it is, it is a challenge to put that between... In a book that you know, not going to be the Bible, right? You want to make sure people read it. <laughs> that it will not be. <laughs> you are not mutually exclusive right. because I think in Washington, the history of that in comparison with global history, we look for patterns across regional and global and on a global scale. But at the same time, um, we also identify uh, local articulations that are unique in their articulations, right? And if, and then I think. The two are very easily compatible. Mm -hmm. You can say you can you can identify the broad up local story that has a specific Latinx articulation because of this. I, I mean, I'm not a Latin historian, but I don't think you have to say, "Oh, it's only this," or "It's only that." Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, what do you? <laughs> no, I agree. I agree. I also I was also trying to follow Michelle's questions about. About what specific method for Latin American. And I think this is, of course, not only here, but there is these complications of race and identity when it comes, let's say, to, um, it just, you know, to say something obvious, it's not black and white. You know, the mm -hmm. idea that we are discussing, you know, the whitening. Um, yeah. it, this is not something that will occur in other places in Latin America in the same way. So I think that there's kind of a U.S. history of race and immigration that is complicated because of African Americans and yeah. and um, Latinos, probably some in different places in Europe too. But then there, because it, countries are smaller and you have more like linguistic diversity, it's also different. So I don't know. I was, but to me, it makes a lot of sense to tell a. It's just how to narrate, but this global history of immigration and capitalism that you find is so, you know, strong ties yeah. in this area. Yeah. But what capitalism does best is the divide. Right. Right? Yeah. The workers are never going to die. That's... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Only over food. <laughs> yeah. So if we okay. don't have more questions, I like thank you, thank you, Eladia, very much. I set out interaction with research, and we will have. Um, I have two announcements. One is that our next um, um, class speaker will be Professor Jose Shibubi, who just joined the Department of Political Science, and we'll talk in two weeks. Two weeks, October fifth here about elect, uh, the his talk will be entitled electing presidents a hidden facet of democratization in some ways this will be not the same discussion but will touch I, I think and much before that next saturday we'll have our um worldwide famous um latin american and caribbean festival here at Fosbar hall um in the patio from two to eight. And I hope to see all of you there. Thank you.